to this test or a study guide on kinetics and equilibrium, we are going to go through and answer some questions. Before we begin, uh, this title up here is going to direct you to a full video if these questions are a little tough, if you need to hear them again. So that is where you're going to want to reference on the channel to make sure that you're feeling totally great. So to begin, we're going to look at collision theory. And the very first question is, what are the six ways to get a reaction to progress more quickly? Increase the number of effective collisions. And there are six ways to do that. First off, we're going to increase the temperature. This gets particles moving faster, so they are able to collide with each other with the proper amount of energy. Um, if we are working with solids in these reactions, we want them to have a very large surface area, meaning that we want to crush any big chunks of solid that are going to be reacting. This gets more of the molecules accessible for the reaction to happen. We want to increase the concentration. This means that we'll have a bunch of particles. Uh, the more particles are, the more likely they are to collide with each other. So whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, we want to increase the concentration. If we are working in a gas system, we are going to want to decrease the volume or increase the pressure. Those two things really mean the same thing. Um, we can increase the pressure by adding a lot more gas. We can increase the pressure by decreasing the volume. Um, so that's gonna squeeze our particles closer together. It's also going to increase the temperature, which is gonna help them to move faster. Um, so that's what we wanna do for gases. Uh, this one is <laughs> maybe not considered by your teacher. Um, I consider it, and that is to consider the nature of the reactants. Some things just don't like to react, and some things are going to just naturally react slower than others. I can remember taking organic chemistry and trying to do um, a few reactions, breaking covalent bonds. Some of those were like triple bonds. Some bonds are harder to break than others. I mean, even if you just look at the periodic table, um, gold, for instance, is a metal that really does not like to react. It is, it doesn't even oxidize all that well. Like gold is pretty stable. If you compare that to lithium or potassium, a group one metal, those things react like crazy. So um, it is important to consider the nature of the reactants. Some things just don't like to react. I'm thinking of the noble gases for your purposes. And then last up is to add a catalyst. A catalyst is kind of like an assistant to a chemical reaction. It's going to help it to um, react more quickly, have more effective collisions. Sometimes it even like picks up molecules and carries them to the right place. Um, sometimes, especially in organic chemistry, I know I bring that up. Um, there's a platinum catalyst that's used a lot of the time and it'll like grab onto a molecule so that the other molecule can come and meet it. Um, so there's lots of different types of catalysts. But either way, they are going to assist the chemical reaction to happen more quickly and provide more effective collisions. Next up, we're looking at this potential energy diagram. And the question is, what is the heat of reaction for the forward and the reverse reaction? What type of energy flow is exhibited by the forward and the reverse reaction? And then last, what is the activation energy of the forward reaction? to H. So in order to figure that out, of course, you do the products minus the reactants, how much energy they have stored in their bonds. Uh, for the forward reaction, we're reading it from left to right. So we would do these products at 30 minus the reactants at 150, giving us a negative 120 for the forward. This energy flow is going to be exothermic. The reaction is losing energy over the course of the reaction. If you just consider like the beginning and the end, energy has been lost. We have that negative delta H. Heat is exiting this reaction. On the other hand, the reverse reaction would make this area the reactants and this area the product. So you do it backwards. And in that case, we would do the products at 150 minus the reactants at 30, giving us a positive 120 for the delta H, which again is heat of reaction or enthalpy. Because we have a positive value here, and in total, the um, substance, whatever it is, has gained energy. That is going to make this reaction overall endothermic. 
Notice here that the forward and the reverse reaction, one's exo, the other is endo. The number is the same, but the sign has flipped. That is uh, true all the time. Anytime you're going to flip a reaction, you're just going to flip the sign of the delta H. And then the activation energy of the forward is that these are the reactants here, and you need this much energy in order to get the reaction to start. And that would be the 175 minus the 150, giving us 25 kilojoules for the forward. The reverse would be... Um, 175 minus 30, so that would put us at 145 for that activation energy, right? No, 135. <laughs> Here we have a very simple Hess's Law question. I believe that most uh, high school first year chemistry students are really just doing these manipulations, um, kind of like this question here. If you're doing where you're adding the steps together, you should head back to the Hess's Law video. I talk a little bit more in depth about it there. Um, I find that to be more of an AP level type question, a, a pre-college type question. For the purposes of a first year chem class, I think this question here will be just fine. And that is, what is the delta H of this reaction if it were reversed and doubled? So first off, flipping the reaction. If we had flipped it, instead of having the synthesis of water, we would have the decomposition of water, which is going to switch water from being a product to being a reactant. But we have also doubled this reaction. So I have gone through and doubled all of the coefficients. So in doing that, I have not only doubled this 571, but I flipped that negative into the positive. And that gives us 1143. No units here. I'm assuming it's kilojoules. Um, so that's it. It's really just that simple. You just flip the reaction. You flip the sign. If you double the reaction, you double the delta H. If you half the reaction, you half the delta H. Up next is entropy. We have four examples here, and the question is, which in each set has more entropy? A mole of gas is going to have more entropy than the same amount of a solid. A dry ice is just solid carbon dioxide. So having the gas where the particles are flying all around all over the place is going to have more chaos and disorder, entropy, than the equivalent sized solid sample. Next up, we have... Uh, salt water and pure water, one liter a piece. The salt water has more stuff in it. It is more chaotic, more disorganized. Pure water is just H2O. This is H2O with some salt in it. Um, so that is going to make this more chaotic and disorderly. If we had 35 grams of aluminum in the fridge versus the oven, the sample in the oven is going to have more entropy. And that's because the temperature theoretically, is going to be hotter. I mean, even if the oven's not on, it's probably warmer than the fridge. Um, so in this case, the temperature is what is controlling the entropy. If we have a hotter sample, that sample, so long as all other conditions are the same, is going to have more entropy. And that's because even though this is still a solid, these particles are going to be vibrating faster in space. Um, so they have more entropy. Last up is the number of moles. So if we had 20 moles of KCl versus two moles of KCl, the 20 moles is just way more chaotic. Um, so entropy really is just a measure of how crazy things are. And while there is an equation for like calculating entropy and using entropy to figure out if reactions are favorable or not, I again have found this to be more of an AP chemistry concept. I may address it later on the channel, but I am not ready to address that here right now. We're working with just plain old first year high school chemistry. And at that point, it's just the concept of entropy that we're working with. For this equilibrium question, we're looking at this graph and answering when does this reaction reach equilibrium and how do you know? In this graph, we have the blue line representing the products. I'm sorry, we have the blue line representing the reactants and the pink line representing the products. And they kind of just come in um, to this smooth line, more or less. And equilibrium is going to be reached at time equals four. And that is because this is where the reactants and products level out and their concentration is going to remain constant. And that is a sign that we are at equilibrium. Um, so in this case, we're hitting just below 0.75 and here we're just above 0.25. 
Um, and because this is leveling out, that is where equilibrium is reached. Prior to time equals four, we are approaching equilibrium. Um, the way that this happens, that our concentrations are constant, is because the rate of the forward and the reverse reactions are equal. Last up, we have Le Chatelier's principles, and given the Haber process, you are asked to determine what shift occurs in four different disturbances. If helium is added to this reaction, that means that we are increasing the pressure um, because helium does not want to participate in this reaction. That goes back to collision theory and the nature of the reactants. Helium is not going to speed up this reaction. It's not going to ensure effective collisions necessarily. Um, but what will happen is that the helium being added is going to increase the pressure on this system uh, because it's just in there taking up space. So the, the nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia are just feeling a little crowded. Now, for that reason, um, this, is, this reaction will shift to the right. So the nitrogen and the hydrogen are really going to pump out a bunch of ammonia. And that's because the ammonia is really going to take up less space because there's fewer moles on this side of the reaction. I probably should have mentioned that this was a fully gas system. Um, this ammonia is a gas, so um, and obviously nitrogen and hydrogen are. So adding a bunch of helium, we want to shift to the side of the reaction that has fewer moles because that's going to have less pressure and feel less crowded. So the reaction will work over time, shifting right to relieve the pressure that was increased by adding helium. Now if the ammonia now if the ammonia is removed, the reaction now is lacking ammonia. So the nitrogen and hydrogen again will work over time to produce that ammonia to get it back to bring back the pressure and to equal everything out. Very similar to the concept of helium being added, if we were to squeeze this reaction, reduce the size of the container that they're reacting in, again, this is going to shift right. That's because it has fewer moles of gas on the right side of the reaction. The left side represents four moles because remember there's an imaginary one right here. So four moles in total versus two. If this reaction gets squeezed, it needs to relieve the pressure, so it'll produce a bunch of ammonia. And last up, if the temperature increases, this is actually going to shift left. And that's because this reaction is exothermic. It is trying to offload a bunch of heat. It's trying to get rid of it. And if you increase a bunch of heat while this reaction is trying to get rid of heat, it's really not happy. <laughs> Um, so because this is an exothermic reaction, it'll shift left because it is trying to, um, it wants to get rid of heat and adding a bunch of heat will kind of make it unhappy and send it backwards. Also, if we increase the temperature, an increase in temperature, uh, the endothermic reaction is really going to appreciate the added heat. So because the reverse reaction, of course, is going to be endothermic, all that additional heat will send the reaction backwards back to the ammonia, I'm sorry, back to the nitrogen and hydrogen because it'll be willing to absorb all of that heat. All right, I know that was a lot. Uh, if you are a little confused on anything, again, go back to the title video. That'll give more in-depth look at each of these concepts so that you can feel super prepared going into your kinetics and equilibrium test. Please subscribe so that you don't miss the next unit. We're going to be getting into acids and bases, which might just be my favorite unit, aside from redox. We're going there next. Uh, leave any questions you have in the comment section below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.